Okay, um, thanks everybody for coming out tonight. Um, and thanks for hosting to Time and Space Limited. My name is Patrick Kylie, and um, I operate publication studio Hudson, which began here in Hudson, but is now in Troy, New York. And Publication Studio is a, a network of several independent book publishing studios in Europe and the Americas, which print on demand. And we seek to attend to the life of the book as we're doing here tonight. So um, it's my role here to begin to uh, introduce our translator, Carl Scoggard. Um, in my capacity with Publication Studio, I've had the good fortune to publish now um, three books with Carl. The first was the collection of sonnets of Walter Benjamin in 2015, which was the first English translation of this little known but deeply personal and important body of work by Benjamin. This was followed in 2016 by another first, which is, which is the first uh, English translation of the Weimar period novel Georg by Siegfried Krakauer who's best known for his influential film and cultural criticism. Carl uh, has also translated Krakauer's other and better known novel, Ginster, which is forthcoming from uh, New York Review of Books Classics, which will be next year or the following year as the case may be, but it is coming, so keep your eye out for that. And that's also a first ever English translation. So I barely have time here to mention Carl's other two previous books of translation uh, of prose by Benjamin preceding the sonnets and preceding my involvement with Publication Studio, which are the uh, much beloved Berlin Childhood circa 1900 and the Berlin Chronicle notices. But all these books are here for you to peruse afterwards. So I hope you'll do that. And they're all for sale. We even have a couple other books as well, um, but we can get into those. So, um, of course, the third book that I've worked with Carl on is, is the one we're going to be hearing from tonight, Jakob von Gunten. And you can consider this a soft launch of the book in a limited edition, as we're hoping to secure another publisher for a wider release later. Um, and rather than a first, as most of all of Carl's other translations have been, this one falls under the category of new and improved. And as you'll hear tonight, there the ways that Carl's really superb translation um, breaks new ground with this, with this book. Carl has an uncanny knack for at timing his translations with or sometimes just ahead of prevailing cultural currents. In 2016, the University of California Press published a cultural biography of Siegfried Krakauer by a leading scholar, Johannes von Moltke. Uh, then just this past year, the first comprehensive English language biography of Krakauer was published. Volzer as well has found increasing appreciation with English language readers in recent years. Articles and longer essays on Volzer have appeared in the LA Times and New Yorker among other places. Uh, and earlier this year, Yale University Press published the first English language biography of Volzer called Clairvoyant of the Small by the American translator and Volzer authority, Susan Borofsky. And um, finally, New York Review of Books Classics has also published a new Volzer translation this year called Little Snow Landscape by Tom Whalen. So now I'm just gonna introduce Carl's official um, interlocutor for tonight, Peter Nagrodsky. Uh, Peter interviews his interviews with writers have been published in The Guardian, The Paris Review, Lit Hub, and elsewhere. And he's served as an editor at Full Stop, Literary Hub, and Fence, Fence Books, which is based here in Hudson. And he helps run the book to film scouting company, Connor Literary. In 2014, while working as an editor at Fence, Peter met Carl. He quickly became interested in Carl's unique efforts as a translator and worked to bring Carl's translation of Benny means sonnets to publication uh, at Fence Books. So you'll find there's two versions of two editions um, of the sonnets there. Over the years since, Carl and Peter have maintained an ongoing dialogue about Carl's work with an interview published in the LA Review of Books and another at a live event in Los Angeles. 
And tonight is a continuation of that conversation. So there'll be reading and conversation um, interspersed here. So Peter, if you'd come on up. And Carl too, come on up. Thank you, Patrick. That was a, a great intro for um, Carl and me and sort of give everyone a little bit of context and welcome everyone. Uh, this is my first sort of live event since COVID and it's just exciting to be in room with other people and um, I'm you know, basking in the glory of that and also welcome to our um, millions of Zoom viewers who are tuning in. Uh, it's really fun to be here and fun to be with Carl. I'm excited for the opportunity to hear him read as I'm sure most of everyone here is. And it's also fun to be a part of an event uh, for, who, for which the Zoom password is Carl. Well, um, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think like Patrick sort of covered uh, Carl's efforts as a translator in such a way where basically no introduction is required of me, but I'll just say um, that, you know, we plan to do Carl's going to read and then we're going to talk a little bit about the reading. And as Patrick mentioned, this is sort of an ongoing dialogue that Carl and I have been having about his work for many years. And we do have um, a forthcoming interview planned as well. So keep an eye out for that. Um, but without further ado, I'll introduce briefly the work that Carl's going to read from, which he has um, sort of provided me uh, notes to read about. So Jacob Van Guten by Robert Balzer is presented as 75 undated and untitled diary entries kept by an adolescent while he is enrolled in a school for servants, the Benjaminta Academy. Jacob is an adolescent who, one learns eventually, has left a thoroughly middle-class home and an elite school to voluntarily enroll in this school for servants. And Carl will talk about how this conceit parallels Walzer's own biography. Uh, Carl also wanted me to note that in the beginning of the book, the, write, the writing is entirely retrospective, so it's in the past tense, but it's interesting that as the book progresses, the narration and the narrator's recollection in terms of his time at the academy sort of catches up to real time. So by the end of the book, the narrator uh, is actually talking about something that's currently happening to him. Uh, and we're gonna have Carl read three pairs of diary entries, six totals, and in between each of the two entries, we're going to stop for a brief conversation. And I would be remiss if I didn't also mention Carl's deep gratitude to um, TSL, Patrick, and also uh, Matthew Stadler, who is uh, the founder of Publication Studio. Uh, they've provided Carl a ton of uh, support and um, help over the years with his work. Right. So without further ado, Carl. Okay, so I'm going to first read you um, the sixth and seventh uh, diary entry, and they they introduce uh, they introduce uh, this young boy, uh, Jacob, interacting first with Fräulein Benjaminta, who is the schoolmistress, and then with her brother, who is the headmaster in the next one. And the interactions between these three people are, are basically the core of the book. So, <clears throat> on the first day, I behaved like an immensely prissy mama's boy. They were showing me the room in which I was supposed to sleep with the others, that is with Krauss, Schacht, and Chelinsky, as the fourth wheel on the carriage, so to speak. Everyone was present, my schoolmates, the hair headmaster, who was scowling at me, and the Fräulein. Well, and then I simply fell at the girl's feet and cried out, it's impossible for me to sleep in the room. I can't breathe in there. I'd rather spend the night on the street. While speaking in this, in this fashion, I was firmly embracing a young lady's legs. She seemed to be annoyed and ordered me to get up. I said, I'll not get up until you've promised me you're ready to assign me a room to sleep in that's worthy of a human being. I beg you, Fräulein, I beseech you, put me somewhere else, a hole for all I care, only not in here. I can't be here. Of course, I have no wish to insult my fellow students and I've already done that. I'm sorry about it, but sleeping with three other persons as a fourth and on top of that in such a narrow room 
It's unacceptable. Oh, Fräulein. By now she was smiling. I noticed it. And so I quickly added, clinging yet more tightly to her. I'll be a good boy, I promise you. I'll comply with all your commands. You'll never ever have to cause to complain about my behavior. Fräulein Benjamenta asked, is that a fact? Shall I never have cause to complain? No, certainly not, mademoiselle, I replied. She exchanged a meaningful look with her brother, the hair headmaster, and said to me, first of all, get up off the floor, poof, such wheedling and pleading, and then come. For all I care, you can just as well sleep somewhere else. She led me to the room I occupy now, showed it to me and asked, do you like the room? I was impertinent enough to say, it's narrow. At home, there were curtains on the windows and there the sun shone into the rooms. Here, there's only a thin bed and a washstand. At home, we had fully furnished rooms. But don't get angry, Fräulein Benjaminta. I like it and I thank you. At home, things are much finer and pleasanter and more elegant, but here it's also really nice. Forgive me for coming at you with comparisons to home and the devil knows what else. Actually, I find the room very, very lovely. Of course, the window up there in the wall scarcely deserves the name window. And the whole place definitely reminds me of a rat hole or a dog kennel, but I like it. And it's important, it's impudent and ungrateful of me to talk like this, no? Maybe it would be best to take the room away from me again, in my opinion, truly a fine room, and give me strict orders to sleep with the others. I'm sure my comrades are feeling insulted and you, Fräulein, are angry, I see it, for which I'm very sorry. She said to me, you're a stupid boy and they'll be quiet. And yet she smiled. How stupid all that was back there on the first day. I felt embarrassed and today I still feel embarrassed uh, to have to think how unseemly my behavior was. The first night my sleep was very restless. I dreamed about the Fräulein. And as for my private room, today I'd be very content if I had to share it with another person or two. If you're an antisocial person, you're always half insane. So that's how that ends. <clears throat> now he's going to uh, encounter the headmaster. Herr Benjamenta is a giant. And we pupils are dwarves in comparison to this giant who's always a bit surly. Actually, as the commander and head of a band of tiny insignificant creatures, such as we boys, it's completely natural for him to be given to petulance, since ruling, ruling over us is by no means a task answering to his powers, never in a million years. No, Herr Benjamenta could achieve very different things. Faced with an undertaking as petty as that of training us, or Hercules like him simply has no choice but to fall asleep or rather read his newspapers, brooding and grumbling. Really, what was the man thinking when he decided to establish the Institute? In a certain sense, he pains me, and this emotion only enhances the respect I feel for him. Incidentally, a brief yet very violent scene took place between him and me at the beginning of my stay here, on the morning of the second day, I believe it was. I went to him in the office, but didn't get as far as opening my mouth. Go out again. Try and see if it's possible for you to enter the room like a proper person, he said severely. I went out of the room, then I knocked, which I had completely forgotten to do. Enter, the voice cried, and then I walked in and stopped. No genuflection? And what does someone say when he comes into me? I bowed and said weakly, good day, Herr Headmaster. Today I'm so well drilled, I simply bellow the good day, Herr Headmaster. Back then I despised this polite, subservient behavior. I just didn't know any better. What seemed laughable and mindless then seems to me fitting and fine today. Speak louder, scamp, shouted Herr Benjamenta. I had to repeat the salutation. Good day, Herr Headmaster, five times. <clears throat> Only after that did he ask me what I wanted. I was furious by now and said, you don't learn a damn thing here and I won't stay. Kindly give me my money back. And then I'm clearing the hell out. The teachers, where are they? Is there any curriculum at all? Any idea here? There's nothing here and I'm going. Nobody, I don't care who, can keep me from leaving this place of darkness and superstition. Besides, I'm really from a much too good a house to let myself be tormented and turned into an idiot here by your surpassingly foolish regulations. 
though I absolutely will not run back to father and mother. No, never. I'll hit the streets and sell myself as a slave instead. There's absolutely no harm in that. Well, I'd had my say. Today, I almost crack up when I call, recall this stupid behavior. Back then, however, it felt to me like a life and death affair. Yet the hair headmaster remained silent. I was on the point of throwing some sort of gross insult in his face. Then he said calmly, sums once deposited are no longer refundable. Concerning your foolish notion that you couldn't learn anything here, you're mistaken because you can learn. Above all, first acquaint yourself with those around you. At the very least, your schoolmates are deserving of an attempt on your part to get to know them. Speak with them. My advice to you is take it easy, nice and easy. This nice and easy, he said to me as though absorbed in thoughts which did not concern me at all. He kept his eyes lowered as though to have me understand how kind and gentle he meant to be. He furnished me with unmistakable proofs that his mind was elsewhere and fell silent again. What was I to do? Her Benjamin was already back to reading his newspapers. For me, it was as if a terrible, incomprehensible storm threatened me from out of the distance. I bowed low, down nearly, nearly to the ground, bowed before him who scarcely still gave me the time of day, and following the regulations, said, adieu, Herr Headmaster, clicked my heels, stood there at attention, did an about face, well, no, I've held for the door latch with my hands, kept on looking back into the face of the headmaster and propelled myself out the door again without turning around. So ended an attempt at revolution. Since then, there haven't been any more pig-headed histrionics. My God, and I've even been thrashed. He's thrashed me. He whom I credit with true rightness of heart, and I didn't move a muscle, didn't bat an eyelash, and it didn't even insult me. It merely caused me pain, and not on my account, but rather on his, the hair headmasters. Actually, I'm always thinking about him, about the two of them, how the hair headmaster and Fräulein, how they just go on living here with us boys. What are they always up to in there, in the apartment? What do they occupy themselves with? Are they poor? Are the Benjamintas poor? There's an inner suite of rooms here. As of today, I've never yet been inside. Probably Krauss has. He's given privileges because he's so loyal. But Krauss isn't willing to give out any information about the nature of the headmasterly quarters. When I question him on this point, he merely stares at me and says nothing. And says nothing. And oh, how Krauss can say nothing. If I were a master, I'd take Krauss into my service in an instant. In any case, one day, perhaps I'll penetrate this inner suite. And what will greet me at my eyes then? Perhaps nothing at all special? Oh, hold on. Hold on, somewhere there are marvelous things here. I'm sure of it. So, that's it. So what do you have to say? All right, I mean, <laughs> what do you have to say? I'm, I'm kind of curious what, what's on your mind having just <clears throat> read through that, that section. How long it took. <laughs> <laughs> no, you were right on time. That, okay. that, yeah, you, were, okay. you, you nailed it. Okay. I, I, I mean, I, I think especially given the introduction, we heard a little bit about Robert Walzer's life, but there's, there's something sort of potentially biographical about this character, Jacob, in, enrolling in the, in the academy. And, and so may, maybe that'd be an interesting place to start. Just the, the We do know, we do suspect that greatly um, his fiction uh, is uh, full of things that strike a, what seem to be an autobiographical note. But of course, the problem is you never know to what extent and to how much he's embroidering and I'm making it up. And, board just to make the... and sometimes they even, the one story will contradict seemingly uh, what another, another story is, is telling you. Um, we do know that uh, Susan Bernofsky has done all this research and has discovered from this source called the Address Book for Berlin, uh, which lists a name, um, an occupation, um, a street address, and a phone number for everybody that owned a telephone in Berlin at the time. Um, so anyway, she found out that there were five different uh, Butler schools in Berlin at the time. And she's figured out which one uh, it was that, uh, that, uh, that, that uh, Walzer himself attended for a month in uh, 1905. And it was on the Wilhelmstrasse, which is a very stately, important street uh, 
on which there are many government buildings. And this school was in a, a, a back house, a rear tenement house in, uh, on, in one of these, um, on the, on the Wilhelmstrasse. So, so we don't we, we don't know if he, he sort of was doing this as some kind of research for the book or he yeah that's to... the basic question is uh, is uh, do you view him as uh, just taking a a month off and and <laughs> enrolling and going to this school to find out get material for writing or does it respond to some sort of fundamental compulsion that he has and that is partially answered by a story that appeared that was written. And during the First World War named Tobold. And this recounts uh, a character like Benjamin, oh, sorry, I'm gonna get them mixed up all night, like Walzer, um, actually uh, working as a servant in a country estate. And, uh, and this, this uh, basically uh, it shows that this character talks about the, the fact that he has a real compulsion to uh, serve. To be to, and to experience subservience. It's definitely a theme that sort of comes up yeah. in his work. Yeah. Uh, and, and I mean, I don't, if, I don't know if you have more to say on, on the matter there. Or there's, well, just that we know that he actually did go to such a place. Right. And, and, uh, and, and had some sort and of. For three months. And maybe and, talk also yeah. about the end of Balzer's life where where there's some. Um, I mean, he. he well, he did, up, he did say off and on that he liked washing, he enjoyed washing dishes. And when he ended up, he ended up um, either, I, I guess he was not, I don't know if it was a voluntary commitment or semi-voluntary because his family urged him to uh, to commit himself uh, to this institution where he continued to write. Um, but- uh, It was like but an he, asylum, he, right? Yes, but he, I mean, he was treated very, very, as a writer that he was. And he liked, he washed dishes a lot in there too. It's part of the normal thing that you did. Yeah. He never seemed to mind. Well, and, oh, and speaking of Vernosky, one thing that Carl has talked about um, before with me, which I find very interesting. So Susan Vernosky herself has translated almost everything. most of Walzer's books. She decided not to translate this one because there is an existing translation by a man named Christopher Middleton that she said she likes or as she communicated to you personally or some power. Right, right. So, so Carl obviously has taken the um, responsibility of translating Jacob Van Kooten. Um, and I asked him, well, you know, why, if there's already this Millicent translation, why do we need a new translation? And, and I think some of the conversation around the new, why you think it, it is important sort of fits into the story about Walzer and who he is and what some of his compulsions might have been. Right. Well, this other translation was done in 1970, 69, 70. And um, Christopher Middleton, uh, sometimes he seems to, he seems to overlook or to actually miss certain, uh, I would use the word dire things that are happening in between, especially between uh, Jacob and the headmaster. And uh, they have, it has, there's a definite sexual undercurrent here. And, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to know where, where sort of a little, a little bit of shyness about, you know, talking about these things, you know, ends and maybe not, not really wanting to like come to grips with it. I mean, in the you section know, you just read, there was a line where um, Jacob says he thrashed me. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Um, the other translation says, um, and he, he, and he, he, he defeated me, I mean, and with no sense that any time has passed, like between this this action that you've just been hearing about, and he and he defeated me, um, which the word schlagen means defeat. It also means to uh, thrash or to beat. And actually, if you look carefully at it, it really says and he and there's a time lapse. There a time lapse is implied, and it says and he and he's even. He's even thrashed me, you know, and that's and the, the thrashing theme comes back like quite a few times. So there's this kind of. Well, he actually, I know this sounds pretty risque, but he, if he, the, Jacob talks about how he, uh, do I have some kind of a problem because am I really trying to like bait the headmaster into actually striking me and hitting me, and uh, which does happen. So, and uh, 
it's conspicuously sort of whitewashed out of the Middleton. Well, we don't know it, if it's it's not totally whitewashed out, but if you that it's a good I gave you a good example, and there's one other one where he's saying, "I'm okay, here I come. I'm gonna I'm rushing headlong." into the gaping jaws of this caged tiger who's never lived, who's never experienced life and wants to experience life all through me. And, and uh, he's, then he says, uh, so, you know, here I go, um, let him slake his ardor, as I translated, on a, a defenseless pupil. And the Middleton says, uh, let, you know, okay, I can't remember exactly. I'm going. I'm going into the headmaster. Down. Yeah. Yes. Um, um, he says, uh, uh, "I hope he cools down at the sight of a defenseless pupil." At at the at the sight of, which is made up basically, of a defenseless pupil. But it's not. It's not cooling down. It's you know something else. It's, I mean, the headmaster is not for cooling down, basically. So, shall we stop? Yeah. Do I, think, one? I think. I think that sort of you know, good segue to your next okay. selections. So these two are from like the middle of the book and they they are just giving you, they kind of show you how Jacob's mind works as it's reflected in his sort of this, I like to call it quicksilver writing. Uh, you know, he, he it's very subtle, fast moving, uh, sometimes self-contradictory, uh, self-correcting kind of writing. And he, here he is uh, imagining, has a fantasy. If I were rich, I definitely wouldn't travel the globe. Of course, that wouldn't be such an unpleasant thing, but I see nothing very exciting behind making the cursory acquaintance of foreign parts. In general, I would disdain what people like to call continuing education. I would feel myself more attracted to depths, to the soul than to faraway expanses. Investigating what's close at hand would tempt me. Also, I wouldn't buy myself anything at all. I wouldn't acquire any belongings. Elegant suits, fine linen, a top hat, discreet gold cufflinks, long patent leather shoes. That would just be, a, just be about everything. With these that set out, no house, no garden, no servant. Well, yes, a servant. I'd engage an honest, worthy Krause for myself. And now I could set out. I'd go out into the streets in the swirling mist. Winter with its melancholy chill would go so well with my gold coins. The banknotes I'd carry in a plain wallet. I'd go about on foot exactly as usual with the unconscious clandestine intention of not letting it be overly obvious to people how princely rich I was. It might even be snowing. I wouldn't care the opposite, I'd be delighted. Snow softly falling between the street lamps with their evening glow. The scene would sparkle, charming. It would never occur to me to climb into a drosky, not in a million years. People who do that are either in a hurry or else they want to put on airs, but I'd be absolutely not want to put on airs any longer, and there'd definitely be no reason for me to hurry. Thoughts would come to me as I made my way like this. All of a sudden, I'd be greeting someone, very politely, and see it would be a man. Now I'd examine the man very courteously, and then I'd see that he was in a bad way. I would register this, not see it. You register that sort of thing, you hardly see it. Nevertheless, something or other would let you see it. So, and this man would ask me, what did I want? And there'd be something cultivated in this question. This question would have been put very gently, very simply, giving me a shock, because I would have been thoroughly expecting to hear something gruff. The man must have some deep wound, I'd immediately tell myself. Otherwise, he'd have become annoyed. After that, I'd say nothing at all, absolutely nothing, but would content myself with looking at him more and more. Not sharply, oh no, very simply, perhaps even a bit merrily. And now I'd know who he was. I'd open my wallet, take out an even 10,000 marks and 10 single thousand mark notes and give the sum to the man. Whereupon I'd lift my hat just as courteously as before, say good evening and go. And it would keep on snowing. As I walked along, I wouldn't think anything more at all. I wouldn't be able to. I'd be feeling much too good for anything like that. A regular starving artist, no question about it. That's who I'd given it to, the money. Indeed, 
I'd know this because I wouldn't have been able to be mistaken. Oh, one less big burning honest worry would there be in the world. Well, in the following night, I might get entirely different ideas. In any case, I wouldn't go globetrotting. I'd rather be perpetrating follies and foolishness any kind would do. I could even give an unbelievably rich banquet weighed down with delights or stage unprecedented orgies. I'd want it to cost me 100,000. The money would have to be gone through in a way that left people agog, that's for certain. Because only genuinely wasted money would, be, would have been beautiful money. And the day would come when I'd go begging and then the sun would be shining and I'd feel so happy I wouldn't have the least desire to know over what. And then mama would come and fling her arms around my neck. Swell daydreams these are. So this is another one where, where reality and imagination are in a very uh, interesting relationship. <clears throat> There, oh God, oh, sorry. Behind our building, there's an old neglected garden. In the early morning, when I look at it from the office window, together with Krauss, I have to tidy the office up every other morning. It makes me sad that the garden must lie there so uncared for. And every time I feel as if I'd like to go down and tend it, I say, <clears throat> these are sentimental musings. The devil takes such misleading soft heartedness at the Institute Benjamenta, we possess other gardens, completely different ones. Going into the actual garden is forbidden. No pupil is permitted to enter it. Why, exactly, I don't know. But to repeat, we possess another garden that is perhaps more beautiful than the actual one. On page eight of our manual, What Are the Aims of Benjamenta's School for Boys? It says, good conduct is a garden in bloom. In such gardens then, Gardens delicate and incorporeal are we schoolboys allowed to gamble. Not bad. When one of us misbehaves, he finds himself as of his own accord wandering in a dark and nasty hell. Should he conduct himself nicely, then for his reward, he automatically takes a stroll amid shady, sun-dappled greenery. How alluring. And in my poor boyish understanding, there's some truth to the neat maxim. Let a person behave stupidly, then he's got to feel annoyed and embarrassed. And this is the painful hell in which he sweats. On the other hand, if he's been attentive and tractable, then an invisible someone takes him by the hand, a friendly and genie-like something. And this is the garden, the kindly workings of Providence. And now he's automatically ambling through cozy greenish fields. When a schoolboy at the Institute Benumenta is permitted to feel satisfied with himself, which rarely happens, since it hails, lightnings, snows, and rains regulations on us here. Then the air around him grows sweet. And this is the sweet fragrance of modest, though hard won praise. Fräulein Benumenta only has to praise, and then there's a fragrance, but when she reprimands, it turns gloomy in the schoolroom. What an odd world for a school. If a pupil's been polite and well behaved, then suddenly something makes an arch over his head. And this is the unique blue heaven above the imaginary garden. If we elev have been really uncomplaining and if we really kept up our efforts nicely, if we have succeeded at what they call being patient and persevering, then all at once a golden shining is there before our rather weary eyes. And then we realize it's the heavenly sun. It shines for him who feels honestly and justifiably weary. And if we hadn't had haven't had to catch ourselves with any impure wishes, a discovery that always brings such unhappiness. Then we hear, goodness, what's this? It's birds singing. Well, then it could only have been the cheerful, fine feathered little choristers in our garden who were singing and making such charming noises. Now let a person ask himself, do we pupils at the Institute Benumenta need still more gardens in addition to those we create for ourselves? When we conduct ourselves decently and decorously, we were rich lords. Though, uh, say I hanker after money, which unfortunately happens all too frequently, then I sink into the very depths of hopeless, raging desire. Oh, then I languish and suffer, and I despair of being rescued. And then if I glance at Krauss, a deep, murmuring, marvelous contentment like a spring takes possession of me. This is the fountain of tranquil modesty splashing up and down in our garden. 
and then I'm so happy. My mood is so good. I'm so mindful of the good. Uh, and they say, I don't love Prowse. It's one of, it's, a, it's, if one of us has been, or rather had one of us been a hero, had risked his own life to consummate some brave deed, that's how the manual reads, then he'd be permitted to set foot in the little Greek temple embellished with wall paintings that's secreted in the greenery of our garden. And there a mouth would kiss him. What sort of mouth, the manual doesn't say. In any way, we're none of us heroes. What would be the point? Firstly, we have no opportunity to behave heroically. And secondly, I'm not so sure that, for example, Shalinsky or Long Peter would be willing to sacrifice himself. I think our garden is a lovely affair, even without kisses, heroes, and Greek temples. I get the shivers when I speak of heroes. It's why I'd rather say nothing. So, I mean, that, that second passage to me is just uh, such a, a strong example of Walzer sort of creating the character of Jacob as a vessel for his own free associative, more imaginative writing um, style to to flow forth. Exactly. And, and I feel like, yeah, that that go. I agree with you. Yeah, I mean, I think I think, and 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 what that points to is Balzer as a, as a person. Um, Carl told me, and maybe you want to explain more, but that he had he had sort of ambitions to become a theater actor himself, um, but was sort of. I want to read you was some, brutally. Here, about now, I want to read something. Um, these are notes to myself. Uh, Walzer fails as a would-be actor in Stuttgart, 1895. Advice from our seasoned actress as recounted in one of his short pieces, colon. You should thank God that you've fallen into the hands of a person who means well enough by you to tell you the truth. You possess not the faintest trace of theatrical talent. Everything about you is hidden, failed, buried, dry, and wooden. You may be the most ardent of human beings on the inside, churning with the most fervent passions. Who knows? But none of this can be seen when looking at you. Nothing is expressed. And then I just made the note. His prose is constantly performing like a lively actor, basically. Yeah, I mean, there's something yeah. hopeful about him sort of stumbling through the failure of being an actor and then finding or, or, or succeeding. I mean, he was, he was well known in his day and, and as a writer. and sort of creating these characters and these narrative scenarios where he can where he can express himself. Uh, it, it's kind of hopeful, mm -hmm. wouldn't you say? Yes, I'm, try I'm wondering uh, like how much, uh, how are we doing for time? Oh, we're trudging light right along. I, I don't are. know that we're gonna get through all those. <laughs> no, no, I know, I, want, I thought, we, I, I didn't know how much we should talk. I thought maybe we should, uh, Perhaps uh, I think there's a lot to say after the third part. Yeah, so you, I think I think okay. we can jump into the third, okay. third section now. Okay. So these these are, happen to be the last two entries in his diary. I, I, it occurred to me to say that, you know, we don't know how many entries he made that aren't in this book. The cut, yeah. The cut, <laughs> oh, and, and that speaking of that, I mean, um, maybe just mention the, the the pencil, the pencil collection. No. What pencil collection? What is the name of his microfiche? Writing? Oh, that. Oh, yes. Yes, but that's not, that's like a long time in the future. I know, but yeah. just the saying, like, he was a prolific writer. You're saying there may be other diary entries that didn't make it in. I, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm just, I'm being, I'm being like, uh, what's the word for this? A little funny here. Because, I, mean, I mean, there aren't, weren't no other diary entries. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I was being fun. I was being fun. I see. Exactly. Okay. So, okay. So, after this long book where he's these this, these fraught relationships have been developing with the headmistress, uh, we call her the the Fraulein, and uh, her brother, the headmaster. Uh, she essentially dies of what sounds like a broken heart, which is, I think, mock sentimental, and she. Um, you might say it's a slow motion suicide, uh, actually. And uh, then, but it serves the purposes of, uh, of uh, our hero here because then he gets to run off with the headmaster because that's what, that's, that's what they plan to do. So after, so I, we, we come back to the story as they're sitting 
at the weight that that he uh, uh, Jacob and the headmaster are keeping, watching uh, the sister, the dead sister. Okay. <clears throat> Yet even as I was sitting and keeping watch like this, I was overcome by sleep. For half an hour, a bit, or a bit longer, perhaps certainly not very for very long, I was transported from reality. I dreamt. The dream I recall swept down on me from up high with great force, covering me in beams of light, that I was on a mountain meadow. The meadow was completely dark velvet green, and it was embroidered and studded with flowers, as with kisses that were flower-like in their shape and form. Now the kisses seemed to me like stars, and now like flowers again. It was natural, and yet it wasn't natural at all, simulacrum and substance at the same time. A wonderfully beautiful girl lay on the grass. I tried to persuade myself that it was our teacher, but I quickly said to myself, no, that can't be. We don't have a teacher anymore. Well, so it was just somebody else. And I literally saw how I comforted myself. And I heard the comforting. It said, ah, bah, leave off with your interpreting. The girl was naked, her body voluptuous and shining. From one lovely leg, a ribbon hung, and it gently fluttered there in the breeze that was caressing the whole thing. To me, it seemed as though the entire mirror bright, sweet dream floated and fluttered. How happy I was. For a brief second, I thought of this man. Naturally, it was the her headmaster who occurred to me like that. All at once I saw him. He was on horseback and clad in shimmering, dark, very fine, serious armor. The long sword dangled from his side and the horse was whinnying, eager for battle. Oh, look at that, the headmaster on a horse, I thought, and I shouted as loudly as I could so that it echoed in the ravines and chasms on every side. I've reached my decision, but he didn't hear me. In a torment, I shouted, hello there, their headmaster, hear me. His gaze was far away, looking out onto and down into life. Not once did he turn his head in my direction. Now, seemingly for my sake, the dream rolled on a little at a time as if it were a wagon. And then we found ourselves, I and this man, who was naturally none other than the Herr Her Her Benjamenta, in the middle of the desert. We wandered about and traded with the desert dwellers and we were filled with a most peculiar contentment, a refreshing, and if I may say so, magnificent contentment. It looked as though we too had vanished from what's called European culture for good, or at least for a very, very long time. Aha, I thought in spite of myself, and as it seemed to me rather stupidly. So this was it, this. Yet I could not decipher what it was that I was thinking of then. We wandered on. Next, a band of hostile people appeared, but we dispersed them, not that I actually saw how it happened. During our days of wandering, regions of the earth shot past, quick as lightning. I felt myself experience whole decades as they went by waving to us, long, heavy decades that had been difficult to endure. How truly strange this was. I think that's the funniest line in the book. The individual weeks eyed each other like small glittering gems. It was ridiculous and wonderful at the same time. Occasionally, the headmaster, who had the look of an Arab, would remark, being carried away from culture, Jacob, it's terrific, you know. We rode camels, and the customs we observed delighted us. There was something unfathomably mild and gentle in the way the lands moved. Indeed, to me, it seemed as if the lands were marching. No, it was more like they were flying. <clears throat> The ocean drifted along majestically, like a great blue wet world of thought. Now I heard birds whirring, now beasts bellowing, now trees rustling overhead. Oh, so you did come along after all. I knew you would, said her Benjamenta, who had been raised to a prince by the Indians. How grand. As dreadfully far-fetched as it sounds, we actually fomented revolution in India, and apparently our coup succeeded. It was so marvelous being alive. I felt this in every limb. Life spread itself out before our far-seeing gaze like a tree with twigs and branches. And how stalwart we were. And we waded through dangers and discoveries as in an ice cold stream, which however helped with our heated condition. 
I was always the squire and the headmaster was the knight. Very good, I suddenly thought. And as I was thinking this, I awoke and looked about the sitting room. Herr Benjamenta had also fallen asleep. I roused him saying, how can you fall asleep, Herr Benjamenta? But permit me to tell you that I've decided to go with you wherever you wish. We shook hands and this meant a great deal. The background to that is that the Herr Bassler has asked him formally, would he consider going on a jaunt like that with him around the world or somewhere and to do magnificent, daring things and have an <laughs> exciting time, you know? So, and that's, so he finally came to his decision in the dream. And then he said it to him after he awoke again and they shook hands. Oh yeah, I should read the last one. But that, the Thank last one, the last one's a little bit here. of a, the last one's just a little thing. <clears throat> so, I'm packing. Yes, we too, the headmaster and I, were busy with packing, with real packing up, calling things off, putting things away, taking things apart, shifting and shoving. We're going to travel. Fine. This man suits me, and I no longer ask myself why. I feel that life demands surging emotions, not reflecting. Today, I'm going to say adieu to my brother. I leave nothing behind here. Nothing makes me, nothing obliges me to say, how would it be when I, no, there's nothing more to would be or to when I. Furline Benjamenta lies beneath the earth. The Elev, my comrades, are scattered all about in every kind of occupation. And if I go to pieces or go to rack and ruin, what will go to rack and ruin? A zero. As I, I as an individual human being, am just a zero. But I'm done with writing now. Done with the life of the mind now. I'm going with Herr Benjamente into the desert. Yes, I'm going to find out if it isn't also possible in the desert to live, to breathe, to be, to sincerely desire and do what is good, to sleep and dream at night. Bah, who knows? Now I don't want to think about anything anymore. Not about God either? No, God will be with me. So why do I need to think about him? God goes with those who have no thoughts. And so now adieu, Institute Benjamenta. So that's that. So I, I mean, is there, is there wanted, anything particular that you-, you I wanted to mention, the, you hear the word elev, right? And it probably doesn't mean too much to you. It's some pretentious French word for pupil that they are, they, you know, for touch of class, they're called the labs at this, at this school, you know. So just to explain that a little bit. Oh, um, I mean, what, what, one thing that seems really interesting to me as a reader, uh, you've also wrote Jacob Van Guten in 1908, I think. So it's sort of right in the context of. I think expressionism in art exactly. and, and also um, Freud in, in, in the world. So I wonder if you can sort of locate the book or some of your thoughts about the book right. in, in those two cultural right. milestones. I mean, I, you could probably do it without even looking at your notes. Well, I could, but I want to see my notes anyway. Okay. So, um, so I say that uh, Jakob von Glunten was conceived and published as the artistic cultural phenomenon known as expressionism was nearing its climax on the eve of the First World War. It is significant that Walzer seems to have written Jakob von Glunten as well as the novel just preceding it, The Assistant, in bursts of speed, in weeks or a few months. And here I make an association. In the same year that Jakob von Glunten was written, 1908, Arnold Schoenberg composed his epical string quartet number two in short bursts of several days per movement over a period, longer period of time, as he claims. Such creative feats were felt by their authors to be highly significant deeds. Schoenberg's second string quartet actually dramatizes in programmatic fashion, the advent of the music beyond tonality, which he at the time grandiosely believed would guarantee the supremacy of German music for a hundred years. While less overtly dramatic, Jakob von Guten is Balser's most ambitious fiction. In it, he explores a highly subtle, moment-to-moment -moment fluidity of thinking and imagining, not unlike Schoenberg's music, which is generated by an intense, 
ongoing and overlapping motivic development. And, and which is untrammeled by conventional tonality. So now we've just read these last two uh, entries. So uh, Jacob's decision to run off with the headmaster is presented as a deed of enormous consequence, the crowning action of a novel, and is anticipated as a life-changing event by and for both Jacob, Jacob and the headmaster. <clears throat> Outside of literature or music or visual art per se, expression of glorification of the deed manifested itself in many ways, perhaps most spectacularly, and this is something that I've been interested in ever since I started dealing with this literature because it comes up in these other books too. Um, it manifests itself most spectacularly in the promptness with which young people of the educated class resorted to suicide. Such suicides were, so to speak, performed in both Schoenberg's and Walzer's immediate circle. And reactive performative suicides figure tremendously among Walter Benjamin's close circle of friends in 1914 and 1915. And as I've been, I, I also just want to observe that it's at least we're told that most Europeans were ready to march off to war in 1914. At least that's what the educated class who were all the journalists, you know, reported. You know, I don't know what the, the grunts really thought about it, but that's, that's the official narrative. And on the German side, at least, uh, this all began with a collective national euphoria. It actually has a name, the August Lateness. And the war, and the Germans believed that the war was going to be uh, short and decisive over in a matter of a few months after knockout blows would be delivered to Russia in the East and France in the West. And I just think this just sounds like the expression is mentality, you know, bleeding into, you know, the most important events of the day. So that's about expressionism. So, but I'm not gonna read any of this anymore. That's it, you know, uh, yeah. what else do we have to say? Well. I, I mean, the other question was Freud, but then also we could open up. Oh, that, that's open another up. thing. But that's not in your, that's off your head. There's, that's but, your well, head. there's an important thing we haven't talked about. And that is um, adolescent sexuality um, was very much in the forefront of, you know, the avant-garde uh, people's mind in, at this time. Two years before Walzer wrote this book, um, Frank Wedekind's Frühling zur Wachen, Spring Awakening, which was written in 1891, was first staged in Berlin, that, that is in 1906. And it was staged uh, with decor by Walzer's older brother, Carl. And the, and the Furlings of Aachen is about, uh, you know, misunderstood adolescents uh, being tormented by not being understood by teachers and adults and, you know, suffering greatly uh, with their sexuality, their opening, uh, um, their budding sexuality. And then, and also in 1906, uh, Robert Musel, the great Austrian novelist, uh, wrote his first, published his first novel, uh, Die Verwirrung des Zerglings Torlis, The Confusions of Young Torlis. And this is a truly brutal book with tremendous, like, basically three young boys tormenting a fourth, you know, and, and basically not much intervention. And, uh, you know, it's a very sensational book. So this is, and this is kind of the atmosphere in which uh, Walzer wrote this book, which has something of the same kind of, th of theme in it. However, strangely enough, um, the book uh, we should say was not particularly uh, well received uh, as were his uh, previous books, which were well received. Uh, he had one rave review. Jamie, yeah, Jacob. Yeah, and he had one rave review. And then after that, there were a lot of like, lukewarm ones. And I was trying to ask myself why this might be. And it's, it's basically, I'm thinking maybe that, uh, you know, this kind of sensational subject matter in Walzer's hands is uh, almost treated whimsically. I mean, there's always a layer of contemplation, and, you know, playing, playing with the idea. And there's only one entry in here uh, where the headmaster actually attacks him and tries to choke him. And that, you know, that he reports rather straightforwardly. And so coming out in the wake of these sort of sensational yes, ones, this is yes. like just. And then a couple of days later, the headmaster to... says to him, but what was that? What was that all about? What was that excitement all about the other day? You know, what was I doing? You know, so, you know, so it was, he didn't even know exactly. He was out of his mind, essentially, for a moment. 
So uh, where were we with this? So that's maybe that might be why you know it didn't wasn't well understood, you know, because the, that kind of material is there, but yet again it's treated in a rather different way, in a probably a more interesting way, you know, uh, with a distance of one hundred and thirteen years. Right. Right. You know. Um, so. I mean, so so we've kind of given a, a little smorgasbord of options for people to perhaps ask questions. Is that something you're still sure comfortable with? Can I just I just see one little thing I want to add <laughs> is that um, this book could be read as um, as a kind of a, a send up of the Oedipus complex, Freud's Oedipus complex. Um, but in this case, um, you're supposed to re renounce your mother and uh, and you know and join forces with your father and become a man if you're a male. So in this book, uh, the uh, mother is or the mother figure, as I see her, the Fräulein, is kind of done is done away with. You know, I mean, she she suffers from a very mysterious ailment and she dies, and then he and his father, so to speak, run off. You know, or say they're going to run off on, a, on an adventure. So. And, it, and I think the, I wanted to say that the Oedipus complex itself is kind of dramatic, isn't it? I mean, when you think about it. You know, it, 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 and, it uh, when is Oedipus complex? Well, it, it's written, it, it, it comes out. It comes out, it comes out in the, well, really, right? It come, it's, it's, it's the late, 18, late 1890s. So this is yeah. within 10 years. Yeah. It's getting forward, it's beginning to get popularized a bit, you know. Okay, so that's why I wanted to say that too. Well, and maybe someone has questions about yeah. Freud. Uh, you know. Yeah. Um, so shall we open it up? I yeah. mean, we're right on time to open okay, it cool. up, I think. Okay, cool. Excellent. Yeah. Um, Who's going to be brave anyone, and ask me a question? Can, uh, can we take questions via Zoom? I, yes, we have one waiting. No, we, we have, have a waiting Zoom, Zoom question. Zoom. Okay. I have a question. Yes. Why did you select Robert Plaza as a, you know, why did you? Attempt to translate him. Why did I attempt to translate him? Yeah, what, what you to uh, why, why did I get it? Why did I? That's always a hard question. You know, it's, there's no, a lot no, of no, there's no, a no, lot no. of chance. There's a lot of chance in what, how I pick things. I have some friends, German friends, and um, I think that um, one of them suggested I look at Balzer. And I was, first of all, thinking that I would do something from the Bleistift could be, you know, the late works of which there are masses of it. Of, Is this the pencil yes, collection? Yes, pencil collection, yeah. the pencil zone. The, and, but then, um, and I- Just say what that is, because it's very- it's Okay, it's like, it's a microscript. Uh, it's, it's a collection of microscripts on mostly individual pages of different kinds that he wrote on for, I don't know how many years, like Somehow six, six like, or eight, I don't know how many years. This. And for a long time, they were considered to be indecipherable. And also they thought he was crazy anyway, you know? So it didn't get, uh, he wasn't crazy. So it didn't, these things didn't get translated until the seventies. They eventually realized that it was just a tiny, tiny, but a certain type of Swiss German script that's normal really, but so tiny that, you know, no one really figured out that it was, he had done what he did. So yes, and so I thought I would, you know, do something from that. And then I just read a lot around Walzer and I decided that I wasn't keen on the existing translation. So that's what, and so I decided to do that instead. So. As a fan of Carl's work, I have just noticed that there is this interesting, uh, and, and Patrick sort of spoke to it before, way that he takes on projects and seems to, um, never be clear exactly why or how he's taken on the project he, he has. Well, I just, wait, I just wait for it to, something to, you know, I wait for something to happen. So, so, and, and, and so after he translated Balzer for the last year, he's been working on a translation, if you don't mind me mentioning, okay. of Thomas Bernhard's Old Masters, which is, you know, just very funny and amazing and something anyone who's familiar with Bernhard's work um, has a lot to look forward and that was, to. And that was also translated already i thought this i thought that it was accurately translated it was translated by a native czech or germans or both speaker into english and i kind of felt that the it, it was a little bit blunted that the 
the word choices were always like circling around, maybe, but not exactly hitting the nail on the head. And I just thought it could be funnier, you know, so basically. And there's nothing wrong with translating something over, <laughs> you know. Certainly not. Spice of life. <laughs> <laughs> so. I had a question. Yeah. Um, I don't know what, this might end up being vaporware, but you were talking about um, expressionism in the context of the, the technique of the, the writing. Yeah. But I was also thinking that, what do you think about? You're a composer, right? I'm, I happen to be a composer. Okay. Yes. Um, so I was, I was thinking that the emphasis on fantasy and the intense subjectivity of this, this work and other works from this time, and particularly in Germany, and the sense of like things being nocturnal and like kind of dreamlike and yeah, completely subjective is sort of similar to some aspects of German romanticism. True, so, I agree with that. Like it, it's yeah. like, and, and what you were saying about the First World War is really interesting as that it's kind of an impulse that's, that's it's rooted in fantasy. It's in this like, you know, we're gonna have the final cavalry charge. We're gonna prove the supremacy of German music, whatever it is, it's like these very like, you know, these mm -hmm. pump full of gas, overheated. It's kind of an astonishing yeah. era for, for yeah. being overheated, intellectually overheated. I mean, right, so what, what do you see the I mean, uh, between like, romance, like uh, well, romanticism and expression? Well, there's this kind of irony of, uh, you know, and undercutting yourself and um, this whole, this whole thing of um, God, uh, for example, uh, trying to think how to put this. Um, I can't. You can't help me. I know. So uh, it's it's it's. Um, God, I wish I had notes on that. And so it's it's sort of like uh, uh, E.T.A. Hoffman, or it could, it could even be like uh, it could even be like. Uh, Stern in English, in English literature, but I don't think he knew Stern at the time when he wrote this. But I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's all a meta, it's, but well, that's what I wanted to say. It's basically, there's this meta consciousness. There's you know, the, humor, there, you, you, yeah, it, at humor, of course, but you're outside the structure of the book and you're right. walking in and out of the book and, you know, it's not and something you're in. Alienation. Yeah, but this, this is not, this is not, this is another question, you know, I got the, I had the impression before I read Susan Bernofsky's really informative, you know, biography. Yeah. Uh, it just, I was uh, basically more impressed with the cheerfulness of this, of uh, Balzer, this cheerful note. Yeah. And then basically he lived a very scanty, oftentimes, you know, pretty tough, tough life, yeah. you know, and maybe a lonely life. But I mean, uh, actually, I don't think it's, you know, it, it has a strange intermingling of, of cheerfulness too. Right, right. You know, and, and, the, and the romantics are, are humorous too and ironic, you know? Yeah. So. Speaking about the format of the book as a series of diary entries, I wonder, I guess, casually, I guess. Who you might imagine Walter would see the, the character of the reader as, right? Given the you know, think about diary. Right. Which generally not intended for the public, though sometimes, you know, published posthumously or occasionally, you know, during the journal people's diary keeper lifetime, but you know, it's sort of writing to oneself. It is. That's um, actually the that's the point I made. I, I my first the first thing I consider is what is the device in the diary? How how does that work? You know, and it's essentially performative as if he's performing in front of a mirror. That's the primary meaning of it for me. And also the way he, it, it vacillates between kind of the formality of writing and the spontaneity of speaking, right? And then the other thing is um, he does have us in mind because he sometimes, he sometimes makes us aware that he's thinking of us. You know, he, he says things that mean, you know, like, and I can't, I'm not, I'm just making this up, but it's, you know, to the effect of you're not going to believe this, you know, you know, 
your diary. Yeah, actually, the, my audience, the audience here did not laugh at certain things that I think are very funny. <laughs> and um, it's like, uh, what was that one he said? He said, um, God, this is the funniest one. The waves? Wait, he said, he said, um, he said, uh, who is, who is this person I'd given the money to? A regular starving artist, no question about it. That's who I'd given it to, the money. Indeed, I'd know this because I wouldn't have been able to be mistaken. You know, what kind of you know, idea is that, you know? You know, right? I mean, and there, those things happen, crop up a lot. And there are other, other ones I read too. I, and I didn't get a laugh for them either. <laughs> You, know. yeah, you can't get it all. Uh, I mean, what, what, one thing I would just point out that it, you know, Carl has mentioned, and um, in all of his books, I think I might be wrong about this. At the end of them, he usually writes some sort of translator's note and afterward, which is very interesting and conveniently at the well, end of the book. This was so the sort of, longest. This, this was the longest. This one has a lot of good stuff there. It sort yeah. of forces you to um, get to it by putting it at the end of the book. Um, but you know, one reason to to read the book and, and buy the book is that you get access to Carl's sort of translator note thoughts too, which is uh, yeah very interesting. Yeah, I, I kind of went, ran away with a translator's note. I actually cut it down by three pages when, just before we ran off some books. But, I think we did have one question from Zoom. Uh, we did, yeah. Uh, this is from uh, Gordon Knox okay. in San Francisco. A known, a known quantity. Okay. okay. Uh, he writes, uh, the end has a riding off of its sunset, but also dissolving into a unique sense of ego to zero. Exactly. Made complete only uh, with that man that suits him. Uh, through the book, there's a sense of an evolution. Is there a sense of evolution of self awareness towards the culmination of an eternal emptiness, Buddha like? Or is it more the dissolution of self into the social, the soldier ants into the national world? Okay. I'm a friend of this person. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, so I don't think there's much development. Uh, I would say there isn't much development in the book. I, I would say there's some revealing, but that's not the same as developing. You know what I mean? And I mean, well, he this, this more to the to his life in the academy yes he does there he does say yes he does you know when he was for he was rebellious at first but now he's just a goody two-shoes like with the best of them except maybe Kraus. Kraus is his the one you hear about Kraus is this incredibly um obedient submissive and rather angry uh boy of proletarian background who uh, who uh, jacob basically taunts all the time and so you get all kinds of out, he taunts him like he taunts the headmaster. So you get all these outbursts. Um, but what, where am I heading with that one? Whether there were soldier ants marching off. No, the sunset. no, no, no. Um, yeah, the development is like increased obedience, but there's, there's also constant restiveness. I mean, this is, he's, this is something, this psychology that's in suspension, you know, it's, 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 it's in suspension. Okay, so he's wanting to be a good little servant and has a desire to be actually does want to be a good little servant. And also he, uh, you know, he wants to taunt people and, and that's the other side of him coming out in spite of himself. You know, and he's actually knows he's from a better house as he says, you know, so, and in the end, I mean, this, there's this whole, this is a way, good way to end all this. I mean, this fascination with smallness it's it's the title of the uh, of susan bernowski's uh, biography clairvoyant of the small and his and uh, know, and the, here and the here pencil, the, pen, the literal smallness yes of the... and here and here you see you can just picture him vanishing in the desert and the i mean you know visually you can see him disappearing you know and uh yeah so he's always wary of uh wary of being grand or striking the grand you know posture or anything like that so what else should we say just to follow up on that yeah so I, it sounds like this theme of smallness is in his work yes it is right here i've not read beyond this book but i'm wondering in this book there's this you know that smallness kind of um being married to like 
sense of kind of being abject or there's this perverse feeling like he he really wants to be like ground down into the it's very world. it's it's actually again it's not it's simply it's there, there's just fundamental ambivalence here but, you know because true. he's also got his back up all the time if he's if he's disrespected you know right that's but, right but so, is that is that same ambivalence or that does that track across there is a, there is yes there's a, there's a lot of it but this is this is like the most to me i think it's the, it's the most elaborate uh, you know framing of it you know so i and i think yeah it's just it's just that psychology just floating and being in, being in suspension is what works so well with this this experimental writing he's doing style so, well that i'm just guessing I, I i'm guessing that it was um it was because uh, it the content it had some sensational comment but it was treated in what might have been viewed by very avant-garde young readers as uh, tame even though there's the one scene where he actually is attacked by the headmaster and he almost gets choked, you know, so, but even so, I mean, even so, it's not grimly brutal. It's not grimly brutal like those other books. It's got a, a feeling of, you know, he can always withdraw into his thoughts. You know, he can always take shelter in his thoughts and in his diary. You know, he's not, that's where he is. In fact, that's where he is most of the time. What was the so, timing between this book and Wendy's institution? I, I believe, was it, uh, this is 1908, and I think that he continued, you know, promoting himself and, and developing as a writer, and I, it would be like the late 20s, you know, and I, I think, and, you know, it's, there's a real question as to just how, you know, crazy he was I mean, he wasn't that didn't i don't i'm not struck that he was terribly crazy i think he rather liked being taken care of is really what it comes down to and he was and he was causing some problems that his family didn't want to deal with anymore he was like getting in, into violent scenes with landladies and that kind of thing he was kicked out of like a mil, like half, like 40 houses or something well, well I, I don't know i can't i can't say that i mean he you know that he traveled all around like many people in this this time did i mean people had very provisional uh rooming arrangements i mean it's shocking when you read i mean they just moved six months they, they did, obviously didn't have a tremendous amount of, like they're like modern people they don't want to have a bunch of collect a bunch of stuff you know they want to have experiences or whatever so anyway they they left they changed housing at a drop of a hat you know and he did it all the time you know. I have a question. Yeah. Um, in your opinion, is there fundamentally, in your opinion, is there fundamentally psychologically something wrong with a person who grows up well off then wants to become a servant? Is, is, yeah. is, is he trust it to my friend Mike to ask that question? <laughs> <laughs> well, is there something wrong with this person? Um, he certainly, it's well, he's certainly an odd, it's a very, very odd thing for anybody to want to do. I mean, it's not explained in the book. I mean, he says basically his father, his, you know, he says his father, as I, what did he say? His father, he, he basically, he felt he was being overawed by his father and uh, didn't want to be around, didn't want to be around him anymore. So, and also there's a hint that he got, had, was, getting into first of all it's this is a fictional thing because uh, susan vernofsky says that he was a model student except for maybe one semester when there was some trouble that was distracting him but that he's an absolutely model you know straight a student all through all through this fancy schooling he was getting he was preparing for gymnasium and uh so that but in in the book i mean there are hints that he thrashed one of his teachers at this in back home you know so I don't know, it's, not, it's left unclear, you know, was he pushed out, you know, did he leave, you know, but it is not, it's not abnormal at all for a 14 year old to go seek your fortune and go to work. I mean, that is really not for a person of his class, it was probably not 
common at all, but the whole idea of being that age and being treated sort of as an adult and going out and looking for, you know, work is, is, is a uh, okay, except in his case, he went and then enrolled in a school for servants, you know, which was a whole nother situation where you, you were supposed to be obedient to somebody. So yes. Well, I didn't answer your question. I'm trying to, I don't want him to well, make him into a, a case, you know. I, I would you know, also it, just say, I, it's I just a fictional probably, character, too. I, I yeah. think that's probably not that unusual of a, of a, of a desire for someone to, who, I mean, it certainly is not in necessarily unusual desire for someone to want to be servant. Well, yes. I mean, yes. I mean, it has a whole underbelly of, you know, sexual meaning also. You know, although in, in, huh? Yeah, yeah. Please, no, please. You know, if you feel that, because in your reading, I felt this rhythm to to Ross's writing, and I'm wondering, do do his does his writing in each book? Is it is the rhythm of his writing different, or is it because it seems just to like just flow out of your translation? Mm -hmm. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? A little bit. Uh, well, this this was the last. Basically, he he devoted himself more to short form writing, except with the. Well, well, that's not true either. I mean, there's there's a. It's, I, let's just say that he he said he himself said late in life that he was more comfortable uh, in short form writing, where this whimsicality and jumping around, you know, is at home anyway. And uh, he felt that he wasn't sure he had real enough control to write novels, but he did write. He did write several. He threw them away. There's just a. We just know that he wrote a couple, and the and one has been rescued from from this micro micro script, you know, universe. And it is. Uh, it's much. It's. It's much more hard. It's much harder to follow. There are characters that keep coming back and forth it's it's only it is really like music it's just like he's got thoughts about this person and that person and allusions to certain things in the real world and and certain themes that he just keeps sounding but you know there's even less of a spine than there is in this you know so but they but they all do you feel that they each have their own rhythm or is it is it just this i would say i know i would say he's got a very pretty much a recognizable Rhythm. Yeah. I love the way that it just flows. I don't speak German, but. Well, I mean, I, I got more of that feeling when I actually had to practice reading it out loud. I mean, I always had a feeling, but when you actually had to project it, that's how you would project it, you know? Okay. Yeah. So I want to uh, thank you all for this event tonight, and Carl, and uh, hope everybody buys a book. Thank you. Oh, I do. One more thing. Two more things. Yes, one more thing. Okay. Well, well, we're going to adjourn to Red Dot to <laughs> eat and drink. I mean, who those of you who would be interested, and you know, you're welcome to come. I reserved a big table over All there. Right, that's the, uh, yeah. That's the wrap up after everybody buys the book and they can go and read it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.